Hello everyone, welcome to the Waterflow School YouTube channel. My name is Adrian Molina and today I'm here with my dear friend Becky, who's part of the faculty of our school. But before we get into a really interesting conversation, for those who are new to the channel, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Hey Becky, how are you? Hey Adrian, I'm, I'm well. Well, first of all, let me share with people how uh, did I come across your work. I was simply looking for people who were in the field or near divergency. And I went to Instagram and you were with the one, <laughs> one of the few, but the one that I resonated the most. And I reached out to you and we connected. And long story short, you're part of the Warrior Flow School faculty. But I would like you to share a little bit more about you just for people to get a broader context of who you are. <laughs> sure. So obviously my name is Becky. I, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. And I am first and foremost, I think when I, I'm doing this kind of work, I'm coming as a neurodiversity advocate with lived experience. Although I also have my 200 hour yoga teacher certification and I do teach and lead mostly in one-on-one -on -one sessions and mostly with neurodivergent adults. So I have been just on this mission to help bring the practice of yoga and all of the benefits to my my neuro kin, which is a word I've been trying to sneak into conversations, but all of my fellow neurodivergent peers. Or like the one I sent you from Instagram, neuro spicy people. I like that one. Uh, that person said yes, neuro my, neuro. my fellow neuro spicy. <laughs> <laughs> Something that you have helped us tremendously in the school is to raise awareness on how we can make our education components uh, more neurospicy, neurodivergent friendly. And I know it has been a work that has taken a lot of your time and I just want to take a moment to say thank you for doing that. And if you could explain a little bit what that work looked like to make our curriculum more neurodivergent friendly. Sure. Well, I'll just provide a caveat by saying, you know, I, I, I did my best to come in with a lens that also pulls from my experience um, as a human resources professional in making sure, for example, like workplaces and processes are accessible for disabilities in general. But when I, so I don't have the educational background, but what I was looking for in helping with this project was making sure, for example, that the content that faculty are creating as part of the curriculum was accessible for, for example, folks with learning disabilities and different learning styles, making sure that when it comes to each individual student's needs, there's a really clear process in place that's welcoming <laughs> and inclusive um, so that people know exactly how to go about seeking support if they need it for their for their journey, what that might look like, and even some examples of things people can ask for. Because what my experience has been, and of course I can't speak for everybody, but I, I have heard this from many other people as well, is that for neurodivergent folks and sometimes late diagnosed or late discovered neurodivergent folks, we have gone through our life coming up with lots of ways to compensate for some of our difficulties, but maybe don't or haven't settled on exactly like what it is we need in order to be successful. So how do we partner with the faculty to help figure that out together so that it's not left up to the student to have to do all that, that work because that, that can be really overwhelming and a barrier. Mm -hmm. You made me think about something. So as you know, one of the main pillars of the school is being a trauma informed yoga school. And so after years of going through trauma informed yoga, education, trainings, and all of that, my reflection in looking back is, wait a minute, trauma informed yoga is not something different or unique, but it's actually a more universal approach to yoga. And the help that you have given us with the school, it reminds me exactly the same. It's not that we change the content or we change our ways. We simply make it more easier to understand that for everyone. But we got into that point because we went through the lens of neurodivergency. But at the end of the day, like trauma from yoga, it reaches everyone who gets exposed to it. Yeah, I had that aha moment just now. Yeah, 
And I've had conversations with people who work in like yoga therapy, for example, who have that foundation in trauma-informed yoga. And what I, on my own parallel path, kind of discovered when I was trying to figure out what, what does neurodiversity affirming yoga look like in practice and the overlap between being neurodiversity affirming and being trauma informed is like they're enmeshed. Yes. So you can't really have one without the other. Right. And, and if you are trauma informed, you're almost all the way there. One of the things, and, and just to let you know, one of the things that I kind of have implemented because of the help in, in the time that you took in redoing all the material and making the information more organized, I understood, I, I knew this before but I wasn't practicing, understanding that there is value on explaining and not assuming why am I doing something for the training. And so now I found myself, I catch myself talking like I don't do all day, but then I said, and the reason why we're doing this is because X, Y, and Z. So I like to let people know of what are the things that I'm saying or doing are happening? What is the intention behind? Whether well, before, I wouldn't even take that time. And now I realize, well, this is not only helpful for trauma from yoga, but it's also helpful for neurodivergent people and anyone. And another thing that I noticed after working along with you and, ev and everything that you have done for the school is that the way that my brain is processing, putting trainings together and teaching them is different because I'm more aware of the assumptions that we make sometimes. And so I'm very appreciated for teaching And that's us, the next big way, step that is sense. that that awareness piece is, yeah, it does. You, once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> right. And that's another parallel with trauma-informed yoga. What you just shared about under, starting to understand why it's important to make those explanations is so important because a lot of the ways that we talk about learning sometimes focuses on the more common ways people learn, but in the neurodivergent community, it's not just how we receive information, whether it's visual or verbal or experiential, but then also how that gets processed in our brains. And so for a lot of, a lot of neurodivergent folks, autistic folks, we need, we're gestalt learners. We need to gather all of the information and create a picture, which can take a really long time. And then eventually all of the little pieces we pick up will connect and create like putting together a puzzle and then you've got the image at the end. But if we don't get that information, that background and the why, <laughs> then we're not operating with all of the puzzle pieces. So we can't, we can't complete the picture. So. And I'll share one thing with you because my boyfriend has ADHD. He has, you know, there's, there's been times like, let's say we're going out to the movies and we agree, okay, we're going to be ready by 8.30 p.m. And then all of a sudden I say, okay, it's 8 o'clock, I'm ready. Let's go ahead and let's go. And she's like, no, but you said 8.30. Uh, and, and, and I cannot go earlier. And I said, why? No, because we agree at 8.30 and I already planned this and this and this and that. And so it's funny because something from the training from the school gets translated even into personal life. And yet it makes total sense because... I cannot assume that going with the flow, which is that, that approach that sometimes I take, is everyone's approach. It shouldn't be. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's such um, a relatable example. Yes, yes. And, and the interesting thing is that I was able to, connect, to better connect with him because now I understand the different way that he processes information. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me a year before, I didn't have that knowledge part of knowing how much certain changes that for me are insignificant for him that are more relevant. Now, I want to ask you one last thing. Because you have such an interesting mix of having your HR, yoga, now you're doing your 300-hour teacher training at large. What can we say to students who are not neurospicy? They are like neuromild, let's put it away. What can we tell them in the context of yoga classes? If you have to only a few moments to have a conversation with someone and tell, if you are teaching a class and, and you have like neurodivergent students, be mindful about these three things or four or two, whatever you, you come up with. And so that's one part of the question. And the second part of the question, if you are the founder of a company or a 
HR of a company, what are the two or three main things that come to your head that it should be done into the program, into their protocols? I think, yeah, number one, which is maybe really the only one we need, is listen to people who are different and believe them. <laughs> and that's that's where we start because nobody is going to overnight, and I think you've said this in relation to trauma-informed yoga, nobody is overnight going to all of a sudden understand all of the different ways that, that the brain can think and feel all the different ways the body can move and interact. Like that's something that we have to do the work and start to develop relationships with folks who are different from us so that maybe we can't really understand what the experience is because we just can't get out of our own nervous system, but we can listen and believe people when they tell us what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they need, rather than what I think happens, what I've seen happen in places where there's just a lack of imagination, if you will, <laughs> about neurological differences, where, where if somebody's experience is so different from your own, there's a tendency to be dismissive or invalidating, and that's really harmful. So listen to people who are different from you and believe them and let that be where you start to, with, with one person at a time, starting to recognize like where your assumptions are lying, where your biases are. Once we see and start to know the biases that were already coming in, the assumptions were already coming in to the situation with that awareness is, is the first step to then starting to shift and look at the world from a different lens, but it's a process. And as I always tell people, my second piece of advice is with any of this kind of work to start small and go slow and be really, really kind to yourself along the way, because it's going to be a little bit bumpy, maybe a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. It's going to be probably a lot uncomfortable. <laughs> so get really comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's, that's, you know, I know that that sounds like kind of vague and, and people often will press me for like, they want really specific things, but the truth is we're all different. And when we talk about supporting neurodivergent students, we're really talking about supporting neurodivergent traits, which ultimately all of us share in common. They're all human traits. So we're, we're helping everybody, not just neurodivergent people when we check our assumptions, when we listen to people who are different and start to believe them, and then start to do the work in small doses with that understanding that we need to learn how to lean into that discomfort and be okay with it. And I think that's one of the best pieces of advice for everything in life. Not expect that everything is going to be packaged in an easy and digestible way, but understand that there's, and I might be wrong on this, but the way of learning oftentimes is by making mistakes along with having a lot of curiosity. And in the context of this particular topic, I feel that your curiosity has to exceed the level of feeling uncomfortable. And that curiosity has to come from a place of understanding that if you don't ask the questions or if you don't inform yourself, you will never know. And also, I think of finding the right people to ask the questions because when I talk to you, I am comfortable putting my ignorance in front of you to be educated because I know that you kindly will explain me things that I might not understand. Or like yesterday when I was interviewing my friend Rebecca, who is gradually becoming blind and deaf, you know, and she explained over and over again all the processes. What we need to understand, I think, from, the, from this side of people who might not relate to the experience is that it takes a toll every time that you have to go and explain everything again and again. And I guess this is my way to say, have the curiosity, educate yourself. And if you find someone who's a natural educator like you are, like Rebecca is, those are the people that you can ask the questions because they will be more than happy to, to guide you. The point here is don't expect someone who's neurodivergent or someone who's blind or hard of hearing to tell you how do you have to behave around them. Take the step of learning and educating yourself. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Because there is a culture maybe in, in the Western society of expecting the folks who are marginalized to do the work to educate and tell us how to include them, which is so it's backwards. 
so yes, I, I, I appreciate what you said and I 100% agree. And if I could just add to that, even if, it, if you're wanting to learn more specifically about neurodiversity and neurodivergence and those experiences, to also be cognizant of making sure you're getting a wide range of perspectives. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy always to share from my perspective and I do my best to balance that when I educate with providing people with information about how others in the community might feel about similar topics if I know that there's a lot of differences. And sometimes people rely so heavily on social media to get information, but there's a lot of my neurokin who aren't on the internet, aren't on social media. And I think where Warrior Flow School does such a wonderful job is getting people out of their comfort zone into the communities, into spaces, where we can actually reach those the, the folks who aren't being represented in a lot of the conversations that are happening, for example, on social media or the internet. So yeah, just gonna yeah. step off my soapbox now. <laughs> we really, we really appreciate you in the school for all the work and we have to do another interview, hopefully when you're done with the 300 hour teacher training. And that will be an amazing kind of full circle in everything that you have done. And definitely will be hopefully doing in the future more of these one-on-ones because I think that in the same way that trauma from yoga was trauma, was a hot topic for trauma from yoga a couple of years. This is the time for neurodivergency and people are interested in learning. And that's a beautiful thing to witness. So thank you so much, Becky, for, for being such an advocate Okay, an agent of change. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me and for, for making space for, for neurodivergent voices to be heard. Becky, do you want to share for those for those people who are in the online world where they can find your website, Instagram, TikTok? Yeah, my website is yogafornerodiversity.com. And I can't manage more than one social media account. So I'm only on Instagram and that's yoga underscore for underscore neurodiversity. Everyone, please check Becky's page because she does a lot of different events and it's a lot of great content in there. Thank you so much, Becky. We really appreciate you. Thanks, Adrian.